I'm going to take you around on a lap in the full rain. So you just can't go over there because it's going to knock you off otherwise in the wet. Wow, beautiful. You can break really hard. Again, a secret here. Are you ready? Today I'm super excited because I'm going to take you around one of the top three most exciting Formula One tracks of all time. It's Spa and here we go. And to make it even more exciting, I'm going to take you around on a lap in the full rain because there is nothing more difficult than in the rain in Spa to get the perfect lap. It's super interesting. Uh, so here we go. I'm going to show you all the special tricks to do a magical lap in the rain. I was on pole position in the rain in 2014, 15, can't remember. So check this out. So first of all, to start the lap, we take a really wide, really wide run here, and then we position ourselves, very important. You can see all the tire marks on the outside, so you offset yourself to there, because on the rubber, that's where in the rain there's the least grip. So you offset yourself to the, to the ideal line where all the rubber marks are, you offset yourself a little bit here, and you put the power down, always one gear higher, because it's easier to put the traction down than one gear lower, because you'll avoid that one upshift in the really early traction limited phase if you're one gear higher. So try and be one gear higher where you can. Okay, so we're powering down, accelerating here, careful with the puddles of course. So now, first part of braking, you brake a little bit offset again, brake a little bit early than usual at about 100, a little bit offset at first because there's more grip off the, off the tire rubber. And then late into the corner, you can cross over to get the widest possible line in. Little bit late again, off the rubber, so a little bit later returning because you got more grip out there. And then in the middle of the corner, you cut across. And again, you're on the inside now and you put the power down, always staying one car width away from that rubber on the outside. You put the car, you put the power down, boom, boom, boom. Oh, I was in fifth gear. Okay, third gear, put the power down, fourth, fifth. Careful on the upshifts here. Now you've got to look, where's the rubber? Where's the, where's the rivers? So where's the rivers? Of course, mainly on the, on the ideal line is where there's the least water because due to the aerodynamics, the water gets fl thrown off into the air by the cars in front, or at least the tires will be displacing the water. So that's the best, uh, best, place, to, uh, best place to go, as you can see here a little bit. Okay, so here, going into this corner, first of all, you chop over the left curb as much as possible, but really careful over there because you have to lift off the throttle a little bit, otherwise it can just, on the curb where the paint is, that's where the least grip is. So you take the curb because it gives you the best run into the next corner, but really careful, slight lift on the throttle to not have full power down there, even though theoretically you could, but it's super dangerous because on that, on that curb and with the paint, it can just flick you off uh, and no chance. So, and then you stay left, stay left, and then it really depends how much grip there is. Usually you kind of offset yourself with one tire here, the whole car, but with one tire to stay off the grip here, because uh, that's where the best grip is. And then up the run here, you got to avoid the curb on the inside there, on the, uh, up the hill, because that's the best place to go in the dry. But in the wet again, you get a jump, you get the paint, so you just can't go over there, because it's going to knock you off otherwise in the wet. It's happened to many people, so you have to avoid that last inside curb up the hill there. And then power down flat out. Here is fine, you're going up the hill, so usually river-wise is not too much of a problem here. Let's power, uh, power down, you stay left because normally the water flows to the right, so you've got to remember where the rivers are. You always have to remember that. And as you can see here, on the track is a little bit cambered, so the water will flow to the inside, so the best place here is to stay on the outside all the way through the, all the, way through the, the, the straight. You arrive here in eighth gear. Again, braking. Now you go brake balance one step rearwards. In general, anyways, on a wet lap, you're rearwards on brake balance. In the dry, you'll be at 60%. So 60% on the front braking, 40% on the rear braking. In the wet, you go a little bit more rearwards because there's less grip, so there's less pitch onto the front when you're braking. There's less momentum onto the front and therefore less load on the front tires in the wet and so less potential on the front in the wet than compared to the dry. So rearwards on the brake balance in the wet, you go around 54 and then in this corner another click rearwards so you're 52 because you have a lot of turn in braking. So again, you remember you lift the front inside, you lock the front. So a little bit rearwards on the brake here, 52. Braking off the line again and then quickly move over before the end of braking and here it's such a short corner so probably it's kind of a benefit to stay quite close to the inside even though there's less grip but it's so much less distance and so it's quicker here to stay very close to the inside rather than offset to go to where the most grip is because otherwise you just do so much more distance that it's not ideal. Here in the second part though you can start to go stay on the outside, search for more grip, really careful, big puddles so you need to avoid that because puddles can be aquaplaning and if you hit the puddle literally it doesn't matter how talented you are you just have no chance you will not even feel it and the car it just starts swimming with the tires it lifts you off the ground and you're not connected to the ground anymore and boom you're gone and there's 
no chance to save the car. So that's always the biggest risk in the wet. So now tight back here, all the way to the left. Now you're probably in fourth gear. Here you can really properly offset yourself again to stay off the grip. And really careful with the exit curb here. We've seen Fernando Alonso, boom, hit the exit curb. I think it was still a bit damp and he just went flying into the inside tire barriers. So definitely avoid the ex exit curb there because it's such a large surface of paint, zero grip and even the white line, super dangerous. So avoid the, uh, avoid the white line as well, super dangerous. So upshifting here. Okay, now, now you can probably, you have to probably brake because it's a very short braking, so you just brake on the, on the dark and then you run very, very deep into the corner, all the way to the mid corner. You just keep it flowing and you use the track so you can go quite wide into the, uh, down here. And again, it's so, there used to be no runoff at all here. It used to be uh, sand directly. Now they've put some tarmac, which makes it a bit easier because it's a bit more forgiving. You can make a little bit of a mistake in braking, but it used to be just a sand trap. And so look, where, look how close you are here for the ideal line to the edge of the track. And you've just come from a huge braking and long entry. And if you just messed up tiny, tiny bit and you ran one and a half meters wider, you were on the, si on the sand. And most of the time when you were on the sand, you were also in the tire barrier. So it's like there was zero, zero room for, for error, which is a very, very scary corner. Also because it's downhill. So when you're going downhill, the braking potential is less because it's harder to stop something going downhill. Uh, so also even that makes it even more complicated. So it's a very, very tough. The corner, third gear here, um, and again here on the exit, you chop to the inside to get the grip here when you're putting the power down um, and stay off, the, uh, off all, the, all the rubber there. And then this corner, early upshift again here because you're steering at the same time, so you want to avoid as many upshifts as possible in the traction limited phase and the early phase. So wherever you can, upshift a little bit earlier into the higher gear, as long as the revs are, too no, are not too low, it just help you because every upshift is such a disturbance to the rear tires, it always causes a snap because it's never the perfect transition. It's always going to give you either more RPM afterwards, I mean, more torque afterwards or less torque, and then it's always a bit of a, a, bit of a harsh transition. It just does a, tap, a little chop, and it always gives you a snap, so you have to avoid those upshifts. Um, this corner is super difficult. Uh, so again, you can see the puddles here on the outside, but nevertheless, that's where most grip is, so you have to stay a little bit wide here, at least with two tires, searching for the more grip, and now, uh, again, avoid that curb on the outside there. That's going to flick you into the barriers on the inside, so you, could, you have to avoid that totally. Now here you can put the power down. Jesus, the whole pedal box just moved away from me. Someone forget to forgot to tighten that up. That actually helped it happened to me in the real car as well, that the brakes suddenly just flopped down. Um, that was not a good feeling. So um, that's what's happening here in the simulator today. Okay, now we're going into some of the fastest corners here in Spa. Super crazy. So here you arrive with seventh gear, downshift into sixth, maybe even fifth. And again, just keep two tires on the outside there, off that, off that grip on the inside. And here, if you touch the white line on the outside, you're crashing. It's a guarantee. You touch the white line, you crash. You're in the tire barrier. So you have to try and carry the speed, but you have to remain five centimeters away from that white line on the outside, and especially on the curb. Do not go there. You are gone. You are no chance. You've lost the car. It will flick, and you're gone, and, and it's a total. You total destroy it, because you'll be with 250 in the barriers. All corners will be off, finished. This happened to many guys. Um, now this corner now is ultra, ultra hard because it is flat, but on the inside, again, there's a little bit of, uh, little bit of rubber down there. On the outside, there's always some rivers, but there's more grip, but you have to try and take it flat even in the rain. But it's so hard because it's impossible to feel where the limit of the car is. And rivers, as I told you, even small rivers, they can suddenly just give you that flick and off you go, you know, and you totally destroy the car. So it's super hard here. And most of the time, you just have to have that little safety lift of like 20% going off throttle just to have a little bit of safety margin because you don't really know where the limit of the car is. So it's a very, very difficult corner, this. Um, it's the most difficult corners in the, in the rain where they're almost flat but not quite. To really to be committed there and to have the confidence makes a huge difference. And that, for example, is one of Lewis Hamilton's strengths, to have that instinctive feel for the limit of the car in such situations where the car isn't moving in any sense. You know, it just has the grip or suddenly flick, boom, all the grip is gone. And to instinctively feel where the potential limit is there was one of the great strengths from Lewis Hamilton in the, in the wet. And, and that's what uh, gives him a, a, this, this advantage very often in the wet. And um, so now here again, you can brake on the outside because it's short braking. Very interesting corner here. You still got to take the entry to the corner wide, staying off all that rubber. Um, but then you got to chop back in because the next one is very important and coming very, very quickly. So you chop back in. And now here you can do the Max Verstappen style and just go really wide and just take the speed through, really put the power down because where there's no rubber, there's good fair grip and not much risk of getting snaps. Uh, so on the outside there, I think it's fourth gear usually, put the power down, go for it. 
Now here again, downhill braking, no runoff at all. So again, it's so risky because you make a slight mistake, you lock the front and boom, you run off the track and you're in the tire barriers. Um, so you're braking there. Again, you run it, two tires off the, off the, off the rubber there and uh, no time to go off the rubber for the traction. You have to stay wide. Uh, again, avoid the white line and the curb. Try and put as much traction down, but you're full on the, you can see all the grip here from the tires, so it's really slippery by this time. Uh, you're all over the place with the rear. And now one of the most difficult corners again, kind of flat, but not really flat. You got rivers on the outside. You got all the rubber on the inside, which is really low grip and snappy, but you have to, it's such an important corner because you have a huge straight afterwards. So, wow, it's so tough, so tough what to do here. You try and keep the power down. If you get a snap and you make a slight mistake, you totally destroy the car, guaranteed. Because look, look where the tire barriers are. They're two meters off the road. Um, and inside is Armco, so you'll total the car, but you have to be committed here. And that's, again, this instinctive feel for where the limitation of grip is. So important here. And just try and get as much power down as possible. And it's, again, there's going to be that safety lift of like 10, 20 percent. Uh, the people who have less, less confidence in the car will be lifting 40, 50 percent. And the people who have really great confidence in the car and a great feel will lift 10 to 20 percent. So small safety lift and straight back on the power. But that difference in lift makes a huge difference. It can be like 10, 10 kilometers per hour difference in the straight, in that corner. And also on the run out then, you'll still carry that difference in speed onto this long, long, long straight. So you're losing all the way down. If you do that 10, 20 percent more safety lift, you lose all the way down this massive straight. So it's crucial to have that confidence. Very, very difficult corner. So here now again, very keep an eye on where the rubber, where the rivers are, stay off them. Um, it's not always as obvious as here in the game where you always have the, the ideal line free of rivers. It's not the case in the real life. Um, in the real life here, for example, in this corner, right afterwards, you have a lot of water across here. And it's really, it's risky, you know, because you don't really see it. And if you do hit a river here, you're gone at 300 and you're into the wall and it's going to be a big one. So it's pretty scary. Again, going in here, um, it's not too bad, this one, because you just have to do a slight break. You downshift into sixth gear from, from eighth gear. Just put the tires off the, off, the, off the rubber a little bit and then take the speed through, of course, avoid the curb. That's fine. Here now, it's very long straight line braking, so you can move the brake balance forwards finally another 2%, uh, back to 54. And then here, you just straight line the car in the last moment, bang, to get the braking straight. At around 120, you slam the brakes completely off the, off the uh, rubber on the outside there because that's where the most grip is. So now you just straight line it for as long as possible. You can brake really hard. Again, a secret here, do not downshift early in the braking. So you downshift late because downshifting is always a huge disturbance for the rear tires. And so if you're downshifting all the way through braking, you're disturbing the rear potential all the way through braking. However, if you leave it to the very, very end, and now in the end here you do six, five, four, three, two, it's such a short combination of the, of the downshift and it's in an area where anyways you're not braking as hard anymore so you can allow for a bit more disturbance and you package them all together in this last part of braking so that really, really helps to give much more potential for the whole first part of braking, which is the most important, because that's where most deceleration happens, that's where the most potential is. So you keep it really clean and smooth there. So late downshifts here at the end of the lap, the top secret, just for you guys. So and now you go back on the left here, um, and you're in second gear, and again, you're looking for the grip. But here, since it's such a short corner, usually you'll have to just chop to the inside, even if there's less grip on the tire rubber, but the distance just makes a difference here. So you chop to the inside. Here, you take a little bit of a wider entry, just if you can, and on the inside, off the tire rubber again, to put the traction down, early upshift into third gear, just to avoid that upshift once you're really putting the power down from second to third, because that's always causing a disturbance. So third gear, which gives you a much better long run out without upshifting, much later fourth gear upshift when you're almost not traction limited. Okay, so that was it. Now you know how to master spa in the wet, uh, all the little details, all the magics about the lap there. Uh, thanks for watching. And now we're transitioning into the hot lap where I'm gonna take you into the hot lap in the dry conditions, just to, to show you the perfect lap in dry on one of the most extraordinary Formula One tracks of all time, ultra high speed. So check it out, I think it's gonna be fun. Wow, epic. Epic. Wow, beautiful. So hard.
What a hard track this is. Man, this is hard. How much? 5,800. My goodness. I can't compete with all of you guys who are spending so much time on here. I just did two laps now just to show you what a great lap looks like. Of course, like it's still far away from perfection in terms of the simulator world, but in terms of real world, I mean, that really was uh, a decent lap. So I hope you enjoyed that. Question one from Luke Nepomuceno. Why do so many drivers consider Spa to be their favorite F1 track? So really, it comes down to the corners that are there. It's ultra fast. And let's take Eau Rouge as an example. It's one of the most, if not the most legendary corner in the world of F1. And going through that on your first hot lap, you drive by memory from the year before, you, you stay flat and you go in there trying to take the best line to smoothen out the line. Of course, now it's easy flat. So that's taken a little bit of the edge off it. Nevertheless, still, you're going up the hill and you'll, as you saw in the virtual world just before, you don't see where you're going. So you're completely looking at the sky. You don't see the exit of the corner. You need to guess, you need to go by memory. And because it's so important to hit that line perfect and hit that exit curb on the top perfectly. Because if you take too much, it might throw you off. So it's just, a, it's an amazing sensation. And it's the only time in F1 that you get such G-force also vertically. Normally you get it you know, uh, uh, longitudinally, laterally, but vertically in the, in the bottom there to get that G-force, phenomenal feeling. And then at the top, how light you get, it's just stunning. It's a stunning roller coaster feeling in F1 car, so very special. And at the top also, you get ultra light. So you feel the car floating through the, through the air, you know, really light, it's, it's crazy. So question two, the Kovic. Because of sparse topography, the track can be wet and dry simultaneously. How do drivers cope with this and how can you leverage it's very difficult in mixed conditions. Again, you need to go by memory. So you need to remember from the lap before, where was the dry sections, where was the wet sections, what do you need to do to get the most of it. Typically at the top of the lap, it will be raining and wet. So there you need to remember uh, the ideal lines. You need to remember where the rivers are, where the puddles are to get that right. And then in the lower part of the lap where it might be drying, like for example in I think it's called Pujon and the double left-hander there. That's usually an area where it's drying very quick. Also because the cars are going through there fast with downforce, so they're forcing the track to dry because of more energy from the tires. Um, there you then need to remember lap after lap where exactly are the patches where it's drying. And you need to remember them because that's where you need to hit those patches to get the best grip. And then you need to remember also where does the dry track stop, where does it get wet again on the exit, because that's where you need to be more careful. So it's all my memory, um, and every lap you're finding a new limit. So it's, it's a huge challenge, as you just, uh, as you just heard. Huh, to, it's a huge challenge to get the most out of it in a drying situation. So question three, Tim the King 98. Spa has the highest elevation change out of any other Formula One circuit. This results in a lot more vertical compression compared to the usual circuits. How difficult is it to cope with the G-forces that are different at Spa? Well, as I said, it's really just in uh, it's really just in the Eau Rouge that you get this vertical G, and it's not a problem for the for us drivers. It's fine. It's not that extreme. So it's just a wonderful and, and crazy experience. You know, the G-forces through Eau Rouge is, is phenomenal. Question four: Callum Harps. To which extent does a slightly negative camber improve traction when cornering? As the corner exits prior to the long straights, as spa are so important, so should the camber be adjusted? Um, so camber is the rear tire angle that you set them up at. And why do you set them up at like that? Because when you have G-forces, you're pu putting so much load on the tire that the bottom of the tire deforms and it gets pushed across. And so you, when you start like that, the bottom gets pushed across and so eventually, when you're in the perfect high load condition, you actually have a flat tire on the ground. So that's why you need to start with angle in the beginning. So this is the outer tire in a normal state. In the garage, the tire will be like that on the rear. And then when you put force on it, the tire will deform at the bottom and it will actually be flat then at the bottom. So you have the maximum amount of tire in the corner on the tarmac, which gives you the best potential grip. So that's a very difficult thing to set up properly because it's always a huge compromise. You need much more angle for the high speed corners because there's much more deformation, much more load, much faster and much less angle in the slow speed corners where in traction you're almost always straight line already. You have very little lateral load. So for traction you almost need a vertically uh, upright uh, tire in the rear and there's a big, big compromise there. And um, because if you have vertical upright and you go into fast corner, it will deform to the inside and you're just losing more and more grip as you're losing, as you're losing contact patch. Um, so that's one of the challenges of doing setup. And in spa, usually it's quite a high speed track. So you have more angle than usually in other, in other tracks. Question five, lol lol. I tend to lose the rears in the corner after the camel straight in the sim. Is that in true life as well? How much do 
drivers struggle with rear grip due to low downforce setup. So lose the rear axle camel straight, yes, that's always gonna happen, particularly because the longer your sequence of corners is, the more overheating you're gonna get on the rear tires because the tires cool down on straights. And when it's corner, 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 no straight, it just gets hotter, 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 hotter. The hotter it goes, the more snappy the rear becomes, the less grip you have on the rear. And so the best example for that is exactly where you're saying at the end of the Camel Straight, uh, after a Rouge at the end, there's a huge sequence of corners, one, two, three, four, five corners after another. And it's particularly the fifth corner um, down the hill there, the last one, the left-hander, which is the most difficult. And you're always gonna have big oversteer in there, uh, big understeer mid corners. So there's so much happening because the tires are really overheating and, and all over the place. Um, so it's understandable so all you can do really is just be a bit more cautious uh, in that phase and go a little bit less far to the limit just to keep it a bit more steady that's what you have to do particularly in that corner question six Dan Butler how often do engineers communicate with their drivers during a lap how do drivers manage to focus on both racing and listening can it get distracting on a qualifying lap the engineer will definitely not speak to you because it is distracting but in the race they will speak to you and the, the engineer has a map virtual map where he knows exactly where you are and he'll always wait for you to be at the beginning of a straight to speak to you um, so the engineer will always just before hitting the button he's going to be looking okay where is he where is he now i can talk so he'll always talk to you in the straights uh, unless you don't have that worked out with your engineer and some drivers will not have done that it's always you know trying to get to perfection so if you have a good relationship with the engineer that's a detail you work on only speak on a straight keep it short and simple and that will help you not to be distracted question seven chalas how intimidating is it seeing a driver getting close in the rear view mirrors Back when you were racing, which driver was the most challenging to keep behind? That's such an easy answer, Max Verstappen. Horrible to have him in the rear view mirrors because it just the risk is just so high because you know he's gonna go for it. <laughs> he's just gonna give it a go. And then it's up to you to decide, crash, open up, or, or defend, or what's going on. Um, so he's the worst one to have in, in the rear view mirrors. And as I was going for the world championship, the last four races, I had him in my rear view mirror at each one of those last four races. And he attempted to overtake me at each one of those last four races. So it just added so much stress to my situation, it was nuts. So uh, dear Max caused me a lot of gray hairs. Then uh, the extra question, Oli Bay, extra, how important is confidence as a Formula One driver other than race victories? What things give drivers most confidence? Confidence is very important. Um, saying that, I was never the guy who had that ultra amount of confidence. In fact, I never believed that I would win and be world champion. Um, so there we go. To all of you who don't believe so strongly in yourself, it's not over. You can win great things even without the massive self-belief. And sometimes doubting yourself is actually a strength also because it makes you question yourself more. And you, if you have this really big self-confidence, you'll tend to blame others for anything that goes wrong. But if you doubt yourself, you more blame yourself in first. And it's, it's a good way of kind of improving yourself, pushing yourself, keeping motivated. So there's a flip side and, and if you can harness that to your own benefit then actually doubting yourself can be a huge strength and we've seen the greats, I mean the greats always speak about doubt um, and uh, historically, you know, the greats in sport, you always think, wow, really, they were doubting themselves like that? I thought they were machines. No, they're also human beings and, and have big doubts and fears of losing. And, and it's just a matter of using that to your advantage and, and kind of benefiting from that. So that's a challenge in itself. Okay, that's it. Thanks again for watching. And remember, top comment gets a surprise gift for me. The question this week is, what is your favorite F1 track in the world and why? So thanks a lot for watching. Please subscribe to the channel to not miss out these F1 Fridays videos. Next one coming up next Friday, of course for Monza. So thanks a lot, bye-bye.